We have been making our way through the Gospel of John, and today we're at John chapter 10, and we will talk about that. But first, I promised the kids a little story about Shrek, the sheep. Now, we will have Shrek. There's Shrek. And we're just going to leave him off for a second. And I'm going I'm to tell you something. That in the Bible, we people are compared to sheep. Because sheep need a lot of help, right? They need protection. They need direction. They need to be led to places to eat, right? Well, Shrek here, Shrek's no longer with us, but Shrek in 1998 wandered off. Sheep will do that. They thought that Shrek was dead. Come to find out, six years later, they found Shrek in a cave looking like that. <laughs> Needs a serious haircut. Hadn't been sheared in six years. The weight, I want to make sure I got this right on my notes here, 60 pounds. We'll do that as people, won't we? We'll weigh ourselves down with ourselves. We'll get consumed with ourselves. Self-focused, self-obsessed, self-insecurities, self-thoughts. Jesus came to be the good shepherd, to set us free from our self-destructive ways. Amen? And so if you're here today, I hope that you will listen uh, closely to the word, word of God. I pray that God will guide my tongue as, we spe- as I speak. And if you have your Bibles, we'll look at John 10. Two weeks ago, last week we had an interview, but two weeks ago we were in John chapter 9. And in John chapter 9, there is a man who was born blind who was healed. And the religious leaders of the day, instead of rejoicing, kick him out. Because he was healed by Jesus and because he was healed on the Sabbath. It's in that context that we see John chapter 10. Let's begin reading here. Truly, truly, I say to you, everybody here probably knows that Greek word for truly. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold now let me stop. They, they had these sheepfolds. ESV Study Bible puts it w- this way. The sheepfold was commonly a courtyard near or beside a house and uh, bordered by a stone wall in which one or several families kept their sheep. Although caves and other natural formations were also used. Such sheepfolds may or may not have a formal door and would be guarded at the entrance by a gatekeeper who would be hired to stand watch or by the shepherd himself. So this area you can imagine that they would put the sheep. Sometimes several different flocks would be there and when the shepherd came and called out, his his sheep would follow. So that's, that's the context. And Jesus is saying... He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs by another man, excuse me, but climbs by another way, that man is a thief and a robber, right? A thief and a robber. If you come to my house and you knock on the door, I'll open it and say, come on in. If you show up my house and you put a ladder up, and you try to crawl on my roof and climb in in one of my kids' windows, I'm not going to greet you with, hello, glad to see you. Right? Because why would you be doing that? This is Jesus' point. The shepherd and the sheep come the right way. Continuing to read. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens... The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Just an important point here. 
Sheep are a good example. In the New Testament, the shepherd, the shepherd led them, and they followed. You can't force someone to convert to Christianity. You can't put a gun to their head and say, become a Christian. Because Christianity is about a changed heart, a changed inner being that leads to a changed life. It's, being about, it's about being born again. True? So you can't force someone to, to be a Christian. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before him, before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Did you catch that? The sheep do what? Follow him. We talk, it's over here. You see it about what the church is about. We talk now about our mission statement being to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with our mind. Right? We talk about the purpose of the church is to glorify God by loving God, loving people, knowing Christ, and making him known. We do that by seeing lives transformed. Over here is a banner. It's been here for years. It talks about we want to see lives transformed by the message and the person of Jesus Christ. We don't just want an event where somebody says a prayer and pretends to have fire insurance, right? We're talking about people who, who have been changed by God, right? And they hear the voice of the shepherd and they follow. We're not saved by works, but we're saved for good works by his grace. Make sense? It's evidence, right? Verse 5, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me, me are thieves and robbers. Normally, if you, you were to look at the Greek context, there's a sense of thieving where you're kind of sneaking things and stealing something. And there's this sense of robbing that's kind of a forced armed robbery. Can you think that way in our terms? Say they're both. They're sneaky in taking stuff from us and they're forceful. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. Hey, this is really important we get. When, when someone like Christopher Hitchens writes a book that many of you are aware of, God's Not Great, How Religion Wrecks Everything, we need to be able to say, don't lump all religion together. I would agree that false gods aren't great, and false religion wrecks everything, would you? We would admit that there's a lot of damage done in the name of religion, but don't lump all religion together. I've been here for over a year now, and I don't know if it's just my experience or if it's the experience of many, many people in Seattle, but getting in conversations with people, I've been amazed by how many people have been hurt by the local organized church. I'm not talking just, just because they had really thin skin. I'm talking about things that were just not right, right? And I've traveled the world, and you're going to run into people. Who, we're not talking about people just with thin skin, but they have been told things that God would have never said. And so it's important that we understand that there are false shepherds, false religious leaders. It's important that we understand that us under-shepherds could never be as great as the great shepherd. And our goal is to, to get people to follow Jesus, not to get them to, to, to merely follow us. We, we want to we push them to follow Jesus. Amen? Not push, I guess, but you know what I mean. Encourage them to. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters, let's go back to 8. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. 
I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Have it how? Abundantly. You, you see, for too many people, when they look at Christianity, what it seems like is we're giving people a fire insurance policy. Hey, you won't go to hell. Here's your get out of hell free pass. The gospel really isn't going to make a difference in your life. And if it does, it's just going to make you kind of miserable. But that's not the gospel, is it? Jesus came to bring us life and to bring it more abundantly. I was at a Bible camp. I was talking with one of the teachers, and they were telling me about a student who'd come to them and said, after hearing about how in Christ we could have eternal life, this young man said, why would I want eternal life? Life, I'll say stinks, but that's not what he said. Do, do you get it? Jesus didn't come just to prolong miserable lives. He came to give us life and to give it more. Hey, and, and the abundant life isn't about Rolls Royce and fancy houses. It's about living with a purpose. It's about knowing where you're going. It's about living with a good shepherd who's protecting, guiding, and directing you. Amen? Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. There are people who, who, who church things and religious things are just a job. They don't really care about the people they're trying to lead. Right? Jesus is not like that. Isn't that the point? And we don't want to be like that either. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Did, did you catch that? You see, the fold he's talking about is the Jewish fold, right? Right? He's saying, there's sheep from there, but I have sheep from another fold. The other fold are, the, are, are Gentiles, those outside the Jewish community. This is important, because we have this verse we like to quote a lot. For God so loved the, that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world. The reason that that is in the Bible important to be emphasized is because it has been the plan of God before the creation of the world to save people from every tribe and every tongue and every, and every nation. Right? If you read in your Bible, in Genesis, it was promised that through Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. We see in the New Testament that Jesus is the seed of Abraham. And we see in the last book in your Bible, if you look in Revelation, that people from every tribe and tongue will worship him. Amen? There are sheep from another fold, and they will come in. Amen? This is important. What I'm about to say right now is added to the sermon this weekend because of events of this weekend. I'm speaking of the tragic events in Dallas where because of the color of their skin, some police officers were shot. I'm talking about protests over events near Minneapolis, where I lived for a while, where fear has come because of the fear that brutality came because of the color of someone's skin. There's lots of fear, is there not? I see groups raising out, black lives matter, and now blue lives matter, officers' lives matter. I see other people saying, all lives matter. But the one thing we need to say that we're not saying is why they matter. Our culture has lost the reason why life matters. 
You see, if you teach kids from the age they're young on, if you teach people that you evolve from nothing and that you're heading to nothing and that the way that society advances is by the strong conquering the weak, the survival of the fittest, then you have nothing to say. And you can say black lives matter and white lives matter and all lives matter and all nations' lives matter, but it has no foundation. But in the church of Jesus Christ, the followers of Jesus Christ can say all lives matter because we are created in the image of God. That the image of God was marred in us by sin. That we are totally to pray, but a Savior came to set people free from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Amen? We, we, we're in a unique place here in Seattle, are we not? Last week I tried to mention all of the nations represented here. People who were born in other nations, or parents were born in other nations that are, that are here. I went home and I go, I missed a lot of them. So if I missed some today, let me know. But we have people on Sunday morning from Korea, right? From the Philippines, from Japan, from China. We have white Americans and black Americans. True? We, we, have, we have people from Cuba, Peru, Colombia, Mexico. Yell out some others. Ukraine. And don't forget our neighbors just north. We have a few Canadians that make their way in occasionally. <laughs> right? I fear that we've, we've forgotten some because you're, all the nations are, are important. Right? Salvation belongs to to, to every nation. And so when we see people gathered from the Philippines and from Korea and from Japan and from China, when we have brothers and sisters all over the world, we can rejoice because we know that the flock that we've been called into is bigger than any one nation. Amen? Continue to read. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I received from my Father. We got some of the kids here. This week we're gonna talk about Jesus dying and raising to life. That's Norm and I's story for the story time in our, in our room. And I want you to know that nobody took the life of Jesus. You can see that if you read the Gospels when they came to arrest him and he said, I am, and they all fell down. You can see it when he said, don't you know that I could call a legion of angels and, and destroy you all? Nobody took the life of Jesus. He laid it down so that he could be our good shepherd. He could grant us salvation and forgiveness. He could lead us and protect us and direct us. He could remind us that I'm leading you to a place that when this life ends, a better life begins. Amen? He could say, don't go the way that you think you need to go. We all, as Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Jesus is the only one who didn't. We all like sheep have gone astray and follow our own way. The scripture says there's a way that seems right to a man, but it only brings death. We are like dumb sheep who need a shepherd. Amen? Let's not get so wound up on ourselves that we become like Shrek that sheep, weighed down with all kinds of self. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I receive from my father. There was again a, what's the word? There was again a division. Let's not be afraid by the fact that some people don't like the message Jesus has. 
Let's not think that, there, that if we say the right thing, everyone's going to agree with it, right? True? There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? There you see the context from chapter 9. And this story, we're going to stop right here. We're going to continue. I'm going to make some points to the outline. If you get your outline, we're going to talk about your sermon outline. But we're going to, we're going to move uh, on in this passage next week. I want to start with some background to the passage. And we'll, we'll go through just some facts that I think are really important for us to get. To understand this passage, I think it's important that we understand some of the background. First, God is referred to as the shepherd of Israel in the Old Testament, and the shepherd of his people. True? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for what? For his name's sake. When we, seek, when we say we live to glorify God, to show God's greatness, there it is. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Who needs that this week? Huh? Isn't there a whole world out there? I don't, I don't know what news station you listen to, you know, Fox, CNN, whatever. But there's a lot of things out there. And I'm not criticizing those news stations, but there's a lot in it that, that whispers to our soul, be afraid. It's good to be concerned. It's bad to be petrified. And we've got a shepherd that says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, Jesus is fully God and fully man. And when he says, I'm the good shepherd... The people he was talking to would have known about Psalm 23, wouldn't they? When he said, I come to give you abundant life, they would have known the promise that surely goodness and mercy shall follow. We can look at Psalm 80. Verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You are enthroned above the cherubim. Shine forth. Or Isaiah 40, 10 and 11. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. The Old Testament points to God as the shepherd. Amen? Two, another background fact. Israel's leaders are compared to wicked, surf, uh, wicked shepherds in the Old Testament. Israel's leaders are compared to wicked shepherds in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 34. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the, sh against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, O shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for the wild beast. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains on an every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beast. Since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against the shepherds 
and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they might that they may not be food for them. Do you see the context of Ezekiel 34? In the context of John 9, where here was, was a lost, herding sheep, a blind man, Jesus came and healed them. And the folks who should have been under shepherds leading them were, were kicking him out. And Jesus is pointing, this is why I came. This is why I came. One of the saddest things, I talk about a little bit in the little book in the back, Overcoming Barriers to a Joyful Life, but one of the saddest things is when people reject Jesus because of someone who claimed to know Jesus and lived totally contradictory to what Jesus would have wanted them to do, right? Don't let hypocrites keep you from Jesus. Amen? The Old Testament prophecy predicts the coming of a true shepherd. I'll just read a short portion of this, starting with Ezekiel 34, 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out, as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered. So I will seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Amen. That's the promise. It's, by the way, why we're really excited about the opportunity with the Vacation Bible School offering this year to use it to try to bring the gospel, to get the, the message of God and his word translated into a new language and reaching uh, some folks who don't have the Bible in their language right now because God is calling sheep from all the nation. Amen? Uh, I already, the fourth part, point of the background passage, I've already made clear several times that this passage comes in the Gospel of John right after the healing of the blind man. And uh, the response of people who should have known better when they kicked him out. So. And the point is the blind man is like one of Christ's sheep and the religious leaders and the false messiahs that had come before um, all those groups of, of people are, are like thieves and robbers. Let's go to the outline of the sermon now for your, kind of your application, take-home points. And I think every one of the, the young people here, you can get these answers. You write them down. I'd, lo I'd love to talk to you about them. Point one, Jesus is the good shepherd. There's deep stuff here, but... I, th I think everybody can get that. You don't have to be a rocket scientist, right? Jesus is the good. Jesus is a good shepherd. He's not like the robbers and thieves. I've been in conversations that almost brought tears to my eyes. And, and I want to say to people, the, the way that you were treated, that's not Jesus. Right? There's sometimes I've had to get with my family and say, you know what? I know I'm a pastor. I know I seek to be an under-shepherd. But what I just did, that, that, that's not what Jesus wanted me to do. I'm sorry. We, we need to, to understand there's only one perfect shepherd, right? So I don't want all kinds of hyper-criticisms of people who are trying to lead people in the church. We all need to point to Jesus. But I would say to you, I've talked to people that have been unbelievably abused by people who said that they were telling them things of, that God would have never said. Amen? Jesus is not like the robbers and thieves. He's not like the hired hand. He's not just in it for a buck. He left glory and laid down his life for us. And that's the third point. He, he lays down his life for his sheep. And, and I believe from all eternity he's known those who would draw to himself, who would come to have faith in him. Do you hear Jesus calling your name? Come and follow me. When Jesus said, come and follow me, his disciples dropped everything and followed. Today, do you need to follow Jesus? Do you need to give your life to him? If Jesus said, 
get baptized. Baptism doesn't save you, but it, but it is a step of obedience. Do you need to get baptized today? Or at least, maybe not at this moment, but said, that's the next step. What is it God's calling you to do? Second point, his sheep know his voice and follow him. It's a strange thing we have in our culture I understand that we're human beings. I understand that we fall, but it's a, it's a weird thing in our culture that we have people who claim to be Christians who make no effort to follow Christ. Right? The followers of Jesus follow him. Three, he provides for his sheep. He saves them. He keeps them safe. We'll talk more about that next week. And he satisfies them with abundant life. Oh, how sweet. Oh, how sweet to know Jesus. He's the one we need to fix our eyes on.